Watcher. It's season 10, episode 21 of the Ubuntu podcast. It's Tuesday the 25th of July, and we're going to discuss what's been happening in the news, the community, and events. I'm Alan, and joining me this week is Martin. Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm all right, how are you doing? Yeah, tickety-boo. And Mark. Hello, hello. Hello, Mark. How are you? How are you? I'm none too shabby, thank you. Good. Uh, what have you been up to then, Martin? Uh, I have been burning the candle at both ends for about two weeks now, and I'm feeling a little bit fatigued and tired out. Oh, dear. I've been spending my evenings knocking Ubuntu Mate 1710 Alpha 2 into shape, which will be released uh, later this week. Mm. Ooh. And what can we expect in Alpha 2? Or lots of exciting new things. So um, there's global menus and the Ooh. HUD. Ooh. And the Ooh. super key works properly in all of the right places. And you can even bind other actions to the super key. And the super key will still activate the the searchable menus. Um, all of the layouts have been reworked. So the mutiny layout, which is like Unity 7, is functionally equivalent to Unity 7 now. Gosh. Mm. With the HUD. With the HUD. And it searches menus, like, yep. you know, when I'm in the GIMP and I uh, the, that feature that I don't know where it is in the menu, <laughs> I can just press Alt and then start typing and yeah. it works. So the only difference is on, on our HUD, it's um, Super Alt to bring up the HUD. Okay. But as well, that, cool. it all works the same way. Yeah. So uh, I'm really pleased with it, actually. It's it's been three months of hard work to get here. And I think we've got all the desktopy stuff stuffed down now. So uh, then we'll move on to some other bits and pieces in the next three months. Mm, awesome. What have you been up to, Alan? I have been playing a game called Rust. Uh, not I, the programming language not Rust. Not the programming language Rust. Uh, the computer game Rust. And I Yes, I've been playing it recently because uh, Liam from Gaming on Linux, who writes about games on Linux, um, mentioned that they have their own Rust server. And I've played on lots of different Rust servers, and um, I wanted a slightly more friendly Rust server. And the, if you've ever played Rust, you know it's it's not a friendly game. Like, whatever you're doing, you know, you're walking through a field or you're uh, dropping down a tree. Someone will shoot you from behind or stab you or punch you or whatever. So, it, you know, you there are a million ways to die in that game so it's it's a bit violent but the gaming on Linux server is a tiny bit more friendly when i arrived someone said hey here's an axe should we go and chop this guy's door down <laughs> <laughs> which i found more friendly <laughs> and so we met this, me and this other guy just hacking away at this guy's door and i made that my home for a short while um so yeah it's it's great i love it. i'm a big fan of open world games and rust is quite open i was and, hoping uh, with a name like rust this was going to be like a classic car racing game but sadly axes and doors and killing people no is not it's it's running around killing pigs getting meat cooking stuff chopping down trees building stuff right. avoid avoiding other people Wilderness building kind of thing. yeah it's 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 quite a fun game it's um it's quite entertaining so yeah i've been playing that a little bit on linux which is nice cool mm. should we get on with it let's do that yeah And now it's time for some news. And first up in the news this week, Google Glass is not as dead as we thought. Ooh. Really? So, yeah, it turns out that there's a division of Google's parent company, Alphabet, which is called X. That'll be the 24th they... division. <laughs> yes, or the 10th. Oh, yes. Um, and they have... Uh... <laughs> They have uh, announced uh, Glass Enterprise Edition, which has apparently been quietly carrying on since the uh, initial announcement of Glass back in 2013. And they've oh, actually got loads of, yeah, and they've actually got loads of partner companies who have been using it in their workplaces in uh, things like manufacturing and logistics mm. and places where it's useful to have your hands busy, but also be able to use some sort of interface. So I thought it was quite interesting to find out that they have actually found useful applications for it beyond just personal gadgetry. It's funny because this reminds me very much of a device that was on the Ubuntu stand at 
um, mm. MWC, and I remember Martin having a play with it. It's this oh yes VR AR VR headset thing that you you look through the visor. It was much bigger and bulkier than Google Glass. Like Google Glass is like super tiny and and small and just fits on the side of your glasses frame. But this thing was quite big and bulky, but had all the compute power inside it. Um, yeah. And it had the same kind of thing where you can you know, use it for industrial applications where it projects like your work in front of you, whether that's a manual or the aircraft engine that you're working on or whatever it is, whatever industrial application that is. Um, so it was interesting to see that, that you know, I, when when Google Glass kind of went away, well, I think all of us thought, "Oh, well, that's that's the end of that for now," and maybe it's one of the one of the things that goes into the great big Google graveyard in the sky of projects <laughs> that you know they're they're never going to touch anymore. And then you see other people coming along making stuff that has a similar function, and obviously, clearly, they were still mm. working on this thing in the background. And and this does seem to be very much focused on industrial and manufacturing. Uh, use cases now so i wonder if we're going to see it as a consumer device at all or, or if it's pivoted completely i'd be surprised mm. to be honest I, mm. I i i've i've seen very few people i, I think i've only in person i've only ever seen a google glass twice were you in, in america own, yep were you in california yep <laughs> 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 both times i yes uh one was at an event where there are a bunch of googlers there so that was hardly surprising and the other one was just a, an event in california and yeah it wasn't it wasn't hardly surprising there was one there but that was a while ago and obviously mm. it seems that not many people wear it's them been, anymore. it's been a good while since they've stopped being a thing isn't it it's what 18 months yeah. or so do you think it's mm. been a while it was quite a fanfare i mean i remember watching the mm. google io presentation when they did the whole jumping out of a plane with uh, you know, parachutes and then the whole Mission Impossible style, getting off the building, bikes down the abseil down the side of the building, run through the building and all that kind of stuff, all while wearing these Google Glass with a continuous stream of video coming from them. And it all looked very exciting. And, and then the reality of it is you look like a dork when you're wearing one and everyone thinks you're spying on them and mm. taking photos of them <laughs> surreptitiously. So I, I hear that these, this revised model has a camera on light. So if you're stood in front of somebody mm. with the new glass on, you can tell whether or not the camera is engaged. Right. But if they're, if they're focused on industrial applications, I mm. guess, you know, their customers would have wanted that. Mm. Whereas consumers saying i want that doesn't really have yeah. as much weight as a you know a large paying customer who has a deployment of hundreds of these devices yeah. it was an interesting article it's worth a read um to see how people are using these things I, I remember when the first google glass was around there were bars and things actually banning people from coming in wearing glass right yes which is a bit daft because you can wear you know, those stupid spy uh, <laughs> glasses. I have a pair. They look stupid and it's pretty <laughs> obvious, but you can record at full HD without, you know, yeah, the, yeah. Well, you Google just strap a GoPro to yourself. There's that as well. I mean, the, that's the other ludicrous thing. Everyone has, like, yeah. you know, high definition cameras in their pocket that are quite tiny. So, yeah, it's a bit daft. Anyway, yeah, have a read of that. Uh, in other news, Mycroft has relicensed their code to Apache 2. The CTO, Steve Penrod, announced that Microsoft Core will be relicensed under Apache License 2. The original GPL v3 license was apparently designed to ensure that Microsoft Code could be run anywhere. But Penrod said this created a conflict between legal regulations and the GPL's requirement for so software to be replaceable. Mm. Yes, um, it's interesting how this is sort of um, appears to have sort of backfired that, well, it's not really the GPL's fault it's backfired, but the reality of the situation is that there are regulations on some devices, like some devices with other licensing requirements that mean um, like certain regulators don't want people to be able to replace the software. Mm. And the GPL3 was designed to avoid that. But the reality is that hurts adoption of Mycroft. Right. Yeah. So I wonder if, I wonder if this means that they have, you know, potential customers lined up where, there might be larger deployments, maybe, you know, for not the not the Mark One, which is very much a tinkerer's toy, a hacker's toy, but the the full release version, which you know you could potentially see in a shop, maybe yeah. in a year's time, mm. or, yeah. or or possibly you know. like 
um, opportunities to build the software into other things rather than the Mycroft say, device isn't itself. That their, their whole thing now, they're not yeah. going to be about the hardware devices, but about the technology and m- making the t- technology available to other integrators. So I can ask my like TV, what are beans? Or, <laughs> yeah. <you know. laughs> And, and hear the very long-winded answer in uh, better quality sound as well, I imagine. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So in, in this relicensing, they're also asking all of their contributors to sign a contributor license agreement as well, which is yes. essentially the same as um, Apache's contributor yeah. license agreement. Yeah, so basically they're, they're aligning their li- uh, whole licensing mm. model with Apache projects, which yeah. is, you know, fairly sensible and mm-hmm. well-tested from a, a legal um, enterprise adoption point of view so that seems like a good fit yeah i suppose of course there's going to be some people who um don't think clas are a good thing who will probably balk at this yeah. and say that they hate freedom but you know yeah i got my email to come and invite me to sign the cla which um i haven't done but i will do um i don't know i've i've signed clas all over the place over the years it doesn't really bother me the, on- the only time it's an issue is if you're working for someone uh, you know, an employer, and they have an objection to you signing a CLA. That's the only time I think it gets really mm. sticky. Um, but I think a lot of people make um, a mountain out of a molehill over contributed yes. license agreements. Yes, I do know people who have had to re-implement chunks of their projects mm-hmm. because someone wouldn't sign a CLA. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it does. It, it is. It is just interesting in general. We we heard before about the demise of the GPL as a, a license of choice. So it's kind of interesting to see a sort of a reasoned explanation of a, a project who wanted to use the GPL in the first place, um, their reasons for having to change away from it. Yeah. Mm. Give us some good news, Martin. Well, Adobe have been to the Undertakers and measured up a coffin for Flash. They have announced that the Flash Palaya will be end of life at the end of 2020. That seems like a very long time away, it doesn't seems, it? But then it'll come galloping over the hill very soon. Yeah, and I also I also have a touch of deja vu on this article because I feel like we've talked about Flash being killed off several times over the last 18 months with different organisations coming out with different um, cut-off dates with, you know, Mozilla doing one thing and Google doing another. But this seems to be a coalition of uh, various movers and shakers who have all decided to agree on a date and a plan of action. So this is, there were coordinated announcements from uh, obviously Adobe, but then Microsoft, Mozilla, Google, and Apple, who were very smug in their announcement, as you can probably Mm. imagine. (laughs) (laughs) We did this in 2010. Um, but yeah, they're all they're all all announced their plan that for the forward and encouraging people to adopt open web standards and to move away from from Flash and to transition away from it. And they'll kind of be uh, unsubtly nudging people over the next few years by making yeah. Flash stuff click to run and then making it disabled by default or not installed by default and then disabled if you choose to install it. Yeah. It's basically making it difficult to use Flash and then eventually just removing it altogether. At what point? Would it be like if I do a clean install of, you know, whatever operating system, can I be confident that there'll be no flash around? Like, At the end of 2020. Yeah. Uh, it sound, I mean, it sounds like sometime in 2019, it'll start to be like, unless you specifically install it and then yeah. go into your browser settings and enable it and then click it to run on a particular web page then it then it won't run but yeah none no flash at all ever will be to, at the end of 2020 i'd be interested to know what um sites like um these flash games uh websites what they think mm. about this kind of thing cuz this shoots a lot of their games in the head because yep. there are so many of these little uh casual games and even some of the larger games that that people play in a browser either at work or casually, you know, while watching TV or something. And there's a ton of these things. There's hundreds and hundreds yeah. of thousands of these these stupid little games that people play. And yeah, they're fa- just instantly inaccessible. Well, Facebook's put out um, an announcement in line with this to uh, to sort of talk, because their big thing is Flash games from mm. this point of view. Um, and they're talking about, um, you know, people moving to use uh, HTML5 or WebAssembly or other 
game other game engines that support things like webgl so for instance unity um and they also have a desktop gaming platform called uh, what's it called game, game room. room yeah right um, that, so they're, they're basically trying to yeah support um de- developers of these games into moving away that's okay for like new development but nobody's going to go back and rewrite something they made 10 years ago in flash no but no one's going to go back and rewrite a game for the spectrum sure they are no <laughs> my, my my point is if you go to new grounds there yeah. are hundreds of games on there which are playable right now yeah and as of 2020 they're going to stop being playable and nobody's going yeah, to but re- i mean old platforms get retired that's what happens to to mm. platforms over time what happens to that little bit of gaming culture, though? Unlike yeah, yeah. spectrum it's, it's and what have that can be emulated, that that era of gaming is going to be lost. I imagine. Well, maybe maybe someone will make a nice little mm. containerized browser that just contains a flash player, the old deprecated flash player, mm. yeah. you know, in a nice little silo that can't break out of it and only has network access, sound access, and or maybe we could just all contribute to Ganache. I think there was a better project that, that came along since Ganache, wasn't there? There was something light or other that was that looked much more promising. And although games are a concern, my 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 bigger concern is every online learning resource my daughter has access to requires Flash. Yeah. So I think there's going to be a lot of um, well, not just in this country, but you know, I imagine around the world, a lot of educational material going to have to be recreated. Yes. Um, there are very good tools for for and indeed free tools for for creating um, learning resources in HTML5. But there's also, like, every tiny little utility that's that's done in Flash, like, you know, a photo uploader that from your, you know, whatever website mm. you have your photos printed yeah. through, they're often done with Flash, and other tiny little applets that you don't yeah. realise are Flash Yeah, initially. there's hundreds of these little things. There's a, there's a little one I came across the other day. It's called the um, the YouTube Video Manager. That's uh, that's written in Flash. Oh, yes. YouTube have some tools that are in Flash <laughs> as well. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, yeah, good. Finally, it's dead. So well, Flash. nearly. It, it's, <laughs> it's got a date to well, be put in the ground. It's, it's had its head cut off, and yeah. maybe it'll survive a little, a little while longer, like a good old cockroach. <laughs> I think that's the end of the news, isn't it? <laughs> And now it's time for some community news and events. And our first uh, news item this week is a public service announcement to let you know that Ubuntu 16.10 is end of life. So there's no more support. There's no more security updates. So it's time to upgrade to 17.04. Was 16.10 possibly the least interesting release we've ever done? I never used it, so I don't know. It had a. F- it had one of the most fun names. I didn't. I didn't use it ever either. Yeah, yeah. You're right. It was. It was an an important one for Ubuntu Mate because it was the one where we migrated from GTK two to GTK three. So for me, it, it holds a special place in my heart for that alone. Well, it's oh. dead now. So move on. Thanks for that. <laughs> Next up, after a successful round of community feedback on what users want to see in Ubuntu seventeen ten. Dustin Kirkland is at it again. So this time uh, he's asking the community which default desktop apps should be included in Ubuntu 18.04 LTS, which so this, will be the GNOME version. So this is the one in April next year. Yes. Yeah. So getting a head start on that. He's, mm-hmm. he's, uh, he wrote a blog post and posted it all over the place and then said, you know, knock yourself out, answer by copying and pasting this and fill in the blanks and then pasted it in all the usual places like Hacker News, Reddit, slash dot. So trying to get as wide an audience as possible for his post, which is a great yeah. idea. And yeah. OMG and Google Plus and everywhere else as well. Yeah. Uh, have you um, filled out the uh, the survey? I haven't yet. I should do that. No, I haven't actually. Mm. I, I have. I uh, I went for <laughs> most. Put Ubuntu Mate. I did. I did Kaja. for. I did for the file manager. Actually, I did put Kaja for the file manager because it's superior in every way. <laughs> of course it is. But yes. um, no, I was fairly balanced in my responses. No, for the document viewer, I did say events because that obviously fits in better. Kaja was a little bit tongue in cheek, but no, for things like browsers, I I um I was really 
looking at that and because D- Dustin said you don't have to choose free software you know if there's a non-free option that you're using ju- just mark it as such and the two browsers that I use the most are Google Chrome and Brave so I put those down as it happens Brave is open source but yeah I, I found that you know when I was answering honestly you know I look at the chat client I'm using well most of my time I'm using Slack now and if I'm not using Slack I'm using Skype or Hex chat so I put all three of those down So I don't know if we're going to ever be in a position where we can easily have a way of installing some of these proprietary things, um, you know, to satisfy people's needs. But I found found most of my answers were actually (laughs) non-free software. I'm sure you do know if we will have the opportunity to be able to install some proprietary applications at some point in the future, Martin. Well, I know it can be done. It's whether right. it can be whether it's going to be integrated in some way in the installer, for example. You know, because yeah. just knowing that certain applications is, are popular is one thing, but then what? What do you do with that? Yeah, what mechanism do you use to get them? Yeah, in your base install, so that from that point onwards you continue to get updates. Yeah, and how do you get over the the uh, redistribution rights of some of those pieces of software? And you know. Yeah our ISO doesn't contain any non-free software so yeah it's yeah it's an interesting challenge and yeah it'll be interesting to see what the follow-on discussion from this one is I think yeah uh on OMG Ubuntu friend of the show Joey Sneddon has written an opinion piece seriously folks electron apps aren't that bad is what he says I love Joey so much for writing this article <laughs> right now yeah I think he was getting absolutely sick of people moaning about yep. him posting about electron apps so he wrote a little opinion piece about his arguments about why electron isn't that bad mm-hmm. um, you still need to be a developer to build them they aren't just web wrappers they don't <laughs> and he he can test they don't add that much RAM overhead, which, in my opinion, is a lie. So uh, it depends on the application. I think you know you'll find that some are better than others. Right, uh, but <laughs> yes, you, you you could say that of any language and any yeah. framework. Some are better than others. Yeah. It's a very generic phrase yeah. you could say about anything. The fact remains. Electron apps are quite chunky, like yes. full stop. Like there is no, there is no way you you don't need to put extra classifiers on that. Electron apps are quite chunky. That's a yep. fact. And the more complicated they are, the more chunky they are. The more yes. RAM they use, the more CPU they use. Um, <laughs> the flip side of that Welcome is though the is that they are inexpensive, relatively inexpensive for developers to create. If you if you're starting a new project now, mm. you can find the skills required to create an electron application far more readily available than doing it in a native tool kit, regardless of the platform. You know, Windows, right. Mac OS, or whatever. And you can make a cross-platform application, and Quite. you can you know, target through and, and much more, much more easily than you ever could with java for example you know electron is really delivering the right ones run everywhere promise that we keep on hearing over the years i think electron is the best example of that that we that we've ever had before hmm. i guess <laughs> uh, <laughs> you it, remain uh, to be convinced well you know it, it's not a few months ago i i keep referring to this i made a stupid tweet where i mentioned that slack I'm in like half a dozen Slack channels and it's eating gigabytes of my laptop uh, RAM, whereas sitting on IRC takes 100 megabytes, right? Right. And I'm in hundreds of IRC channels. Mm -hmm. Uh, Why don't you use (laughs) (laughs) HTOP? And that that tweet is like the single most popular thing I've ever tweeted. It resonates with people because people realize that things like Slack and many other Electron apps are really chunky and it's frustrating to have your well, laptop swapping constantly just to be able to chat to someone and post stupid pictures. It seems satisfying <laughs> you. It's dead simple. As soon as Slack you use the same amount of memory as RC, it's all going to be fine. This is why everyone should use Slack Term, the command line version of Slack. Yeah. Anyway, I I um I hear you've been blogging, Popey. Yes, I dusted off my uh, my blog and uh, and posted uh, an article uh, about the Ubuntu Artful images uh, that we wanted people to test out because they now have 
GNOME as the default, and this is what will become Ubuntu 17.10. They'll have GNOME by default um, and GDM as the login manager instead of LightDM. And there's also the option to log in to a Wayland session. Plus, there's loads of other good stuff in there like newer network manager, newer Bluetooth stack, loads newer of other good Pulse stuff, audio. newer kernel, all that kind of good stuff. So I'm really, really encouraging people well before 1710 is anywhere near ready to try those ISO images out and yeah. not not like formal testing, not, you know, going through a prescribed set of tests, but use it as you would a normal machine. It's not It's not ready to be your primary desktop because it's not yep. released yet, but if you've got a spare laptop or in a VM, preferably on real hardware, try it out, uh, see what works, see what breaks. If there's any things you find that are buggy, then file a bug and tag it July Shakedown. And um, I think there's like 30-odd bugs already filed since last week. So, you know, people are doing it and testing it, and that's good. Yeah, and uh, you'll find a link in our show notes to Popey's blog that ex- explains in simple terms how you can do some casual testing and file a bug if you find one. Hmm. Cool. Shall we skip ahead to some events? Yes. So first up, we have Freenode Live. So this is the 28th and 29th of October at Bristol Science Centre. So is this a conference where people sit around and chat to each other on IRC? Yeah. So where was I? Oh, I was at, uh, I was at an event. Uh, last night and we were joking about Freenode Live and someone joked uh, like halfway through the event to half the people in the room just leave <laughs> <laughs> and there are people like That's sitting on their own conference. yeah, talking yeah. to themselves in a room on their own <laughs> like uh, loads of IRC jokes coming up in the pub last night, it was brilliant uh, no, it's, it's not it's like a tech uh, event with uh, presentations and exhibi- exhibition space um, I was only pinged about this uh, yesterday by Crystal from uh, Freenode, and they've got a few speakers lined up. I think they've got some announcements coming, but they've got some interesting speakers lined up. I think Matthew Garrett might be coming over, oh, wow. and um, Matt Parker, who does uh, maths-based YouTube videos. I think he's giving a talk as well. So Cool. Yeah. Interesting. Freenode have recently been acquired by Private Internet Access, haven't they? Have they really? I well, thought there was something sponsors. like that. Yeah. yeah, some sort of partnership. Yeah, kind of thing. Right. okay. Yeah. Have we got any more events, Mark? We do. We have Og Camp, Woo-hoo! which is on the nineteenth and twentieth of August. Well, uh, that's getting Can- close now. Yep, at Canterbury Christ Church University in the UK, and it's sponsored by Entroware and the Ubuntu community. Awesome. Go Entroware and go us. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> and yeah. Um, we uh, they've announced the the first round of scheduled speakers for the main room scheduled track um ian hutchinson from if richard brown from Sue's, liz Lut. oh god i had this in my head earlier lutgendorf there we go from gds uh, government digital service okay uh, daniel knox from the university of kent makerspace and of course all of you lot because it's an unconference so you can come along and give your own talks mm-hmm. um so you can find out more about the speakers and how to give your own talk on the website at orgcamp.org there is also a call out for crew at the moment so if you're going to the event and you want to really get involved um and meet people and get a free t-shirt a free limited edition not available in the shops t-shirt <laughs> um you can join the crew it basically just involves you know helping out uh helping people find rooms and get in and selling merch and generally having fun um so if you're interested in doing that you can email uh john the nice guy on ogcamp at sprig.gs and we'll have the email in the show notes yep also, if you're interested in sponsoring the event, uh, you could also uh, email John Spriggs or camp at sprig.gs yes. uh, because they're looking for additional sponsors on top of the Entroware and Ubuntu community. Yes, sponsors. I think in particular, um, if you are the kind of company who might be able to donate something to the legendary Old Camp raffle in exchange for some uh, promotion, then uh, we would be very grateful to hear from you, I think. Mm. Excellent. Right, is that all the uh, events? It is. Mm -hmm. We know you've got a Facebook account, so stop sharing cat photos for a moment and like or share our posts so your friends and family can find the Ubuntu podcast.
Well, thank you for listening. That's all for episode 21. And uh, we'll be back next week when we're going to be reviewing the Entroware Apollo laptop and announcing a competition to let you potentially win that very laptop. And we'll also have some virtual private love. Love. Whatever you want to call it. <laughs> love. Yes. So, yes, listen in next week for details about the Entroware Apollo laptop and the opportunity to win that laptop. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 I can hear typing. I heard typing. Who was typing? It wasn't me. Whoops. <laughs>